first, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you'd have the time to take part in some market research. Um, what's it about? About this club and your experiences and opinions about being a member. It'll take less than five minutes. Oh... OK, then, as long as it's quick. <laughs> Can I start by taking your name? It's Selina Thompson. Is that T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes. OK, great. Thanks. And what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant, but I'm between jobs at the moment. I understand. But that's the job I'll put down on the form. And... Would you mind my asking which age group you fall into? Below 30, 31 to 50, and above? Over 50, <laughs> I think we can safely say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And which type of membership do you have? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean how long... Of... No, is it a single-person membership? Oh, right, no, it's a family membership. <laughs> thanks. And... How long have you been a member? Ooh, let me see. Uh, I was certainly here five years ago, and it was probably two to three years more than that. Mm -hmm. Shall I put down eight? Oh, I remember now. It's nine, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I've got that. And the last question in this first part is, what brought you to the club? Uh, sorry? Uh, how did you find out about the club? Did you see any ads? Well, I, I did, actually. But I have to say I wasn't really attracted to the club because of that. It was through word of mouth. So you were recommended by a friend? <laughs> actually, my doctor. Oh. I'd been suffering from high blood pressure, and he said the club was very supportive of people with that condition, so I signed up. Mm, great. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, for the second part of the form, I want to ask a bit more about your experience of the club. Sure. Uh, how often would you say you use the club? <sighs> it varies enormously, depending on how busy I am. Mm, of course. But on average, per month? I'd say it averages out at twice a week. OK, so eight on average. Yeah, and four of those are aqua aerobics classes. That leads me to the next question. Would you say the swimming pool is the facility you make most use of? Fair to say that, yep. Right, thanks. And are there any facilities you don't use? Hmm. One area I realise I've never used is the tennis courts. Mm. And there's one simple reason for that. You don't play tennis? <laughs> Actually, I'm not bad at it. Oh. It's that I'm not happy having to pay extra for that privilege. Oh, right. I've made a note of that. Thanks. Mm. <clears throat> now, in the last section, are there any suggestions or recommendations you have for improvements to the club? Only about health and fitness? Anything at all? Well, I'd like to see more social events. Oh. It isn't just a question of getting together for games or classes, but other things, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. And another thing that I was thinking when I had my yoga class in the gym last night, we were all sweltering in the heat. Uh, 
was that I think they should put in, well, you know... Uh, air conditioning. Uh, that's exactly what I mean. Mm. The rooms are really light and well designed, but they do need proper installations. Sure. Well, I've made a note of that. Good. So, is there anything else you'd like to suggest? Uh, about quality of service, for example? Oh, everyone's very nice here. They couldn't be more friendly and helpful. Oh, but I tell you what, it's a shame the restaurant isn't open in the evening on Saturday. And Sunday as well, for that matter. Oh. So, the club should... Yeah, open it later on those days. OK. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> all the questions I have. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the whole survey in the correct order and answer the questions. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Uh, excuse me. Good morning. We're students from St Anne's School and we're doing a class survey. Have you got five minutes to answer a few questions? Uh, I suppose so. What are the questions about? About spending habits, people's attitudes to money and what they spend money on. Well, yes. OK. But only five minutes. Thank you. OK. First of all, if you don't mind answering, what income band are you in? You just need to say low, average or high. Oh, that's difficult to say. Uh, I don't know how much everyone else makes. <laughs> I'm certainly not poor, but I'm not rich either. Certainly not after I've paid all my bills. Shall we say in the middle then? Yes, I think so. And how much money do you feel you have to spend? You said that you have to pay a lot of bills. Yes, I feel that I don't have very much. I earn quite good money, but it doesn't feel like that most of the time. I guess everyone would like to have a bit more money, though. OK, so what do you spend most of your money on? Well, most of it goes on monthly expenses. I've got a big mortgage on my house, and my children's school fees are very high. After I've paid for gas and electricity and water, and all the insurance on the house and my car, I don't have much left. I like taking my wife out to a nice restaurant once a month, but I don't very often buy clothes. Oh, and I collect radios. <laughs> Old radios. That's my hobby. And how do you usually pay for the things you buy? I use my debit card for most things these days. I have two credit cards, but I don't like using them. I prefer to pay for things immediately. Otherwise, I feel I'm getting into debt. I pay my bills online or over the telephone. I usually have between £10 and £20 in cash with me to pay for emergencies, taxi fares and that kind of thing. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20.
You will now listen to the second part of the talk. What do you think is good value for money? Hmm, not very much to tell you the truth. Everything seems to cost more than it should these days. I think my telephone and internet broadband package is good value for money, though. That's my telephone line, any number of national calls, and unlimited internet use for only £22 a month. I think at least one member of my family is online for an hour or more every day. I think £22 is a very good deal. And what do you think is a waste of money? Personally, I don't understand why anyone buys a new car. They are so expensive, and as soon as you drive them out of the showroom, they're worth £3,000 less. Perhaps I'm just saying it because I can't afford a new car myself, but to me, it seems so much more sensible to buy a good second hand car for half the money. Do you ever buy anything you can't afford? Yes, I collect radios, old radios. I have nine now, and they're quite expensive. I paid £350 for a 1950s radio last month. I didn't have much money for the rest of the month after that. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but it's important to treat yourself occasionally, don't you think? My wife buys nice perfume and lots of clothes, and I have my radios. OK, so finally, would you say that you're a spender or a saver? Well, as I said, I don't really have much to save, but I guess I'm a saver rather than a spender. It's good to enjoy money if you have it, but you must save for a rainy day. You never know what will happen in the future. Thank you very much for talking to us. Have a nice day now. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students talking about a class assignment about wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions 21 to 25. OK, let's go over the requirements and see what we have left to do. Let's see. We have to give the professor a written summary of the information we've gathered on our topic, wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. The other written thing we have to turn in is a case study of the rehabilitation of one bird. We have the information on that already. Right. All we have to do is write it up. What about charts and graphs? Do we need to include something like that? I don't think so. They aren't really relevant, but we do have to turn in a list of the resources we used. Naturally. What about videos? I heard some of the other students were doing that. Well, I guess that must be optional, because I don't see it on the requirements list. OK, we should start planning our class presentation since that counts for half the grade. We've looked at lots of sources of information, but I think our best source was the interviews we did with the wildlife rehabilitators. Agreed. That and the journal articles. I think we have enough information from those two sources for the presentation anyhow. The books we looked at weren't all that helpful. I wonder if we should try to bring in some live birds for the presentation. That would be too difficult, don't you think? But we have lots of photos of rehabilitated birds. We can show those.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right. OK. I think we should start by talking about how to rescue a bird. Probably first we should help people understand which birds need rescuing. Yeah, that's really important because a lot of times people see a baby bird that's all alone or they find a bird sitting on the ground and they think it needs to be rescued. And usually those are just baby birds learning to fly. So we should emphasize that people should only attempt to rescue a bird that's clearly injured. For certain kinds of birds the rescuer needs to wear protective gloves because some of those birds have sharp claws and can tear your shirt or worse injure your face or some other part of your body. Yes, that's an important point. OK, next, let's tell people to put the injured bird in a box, a box with good air circulation. We should let them know that a cage isn't necessary and a bag, especially a plastic one, could hurt the bird more. Another thing we need to say is that the best way to help the bird stay calm is not by petting it or talking to it, but by leaving it completely alone. Then people should take the bird to the bird rescue center as soon as possible. Right. And we should also point out that when they're driving the bird to the rescue center, it's better not to play music on the radio or talk loudly because those things just stress the bird. Yes. It's better just to speak quietly while you have the bird in the car. OK, we've got that part covered. Next we should talk about what happens at the rescue center. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture on international trade, I'm going to look at the issue of protectionism. I'll start off with a definition of protectionism and then go on to look at the methods countries have used to protect their economy. Following this, I'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of protectionism when compared to free and open trade. So let's define protectionism. Protectionism at its simplest is the opposite of free trade. It is the practice of protecting domestic industries from foreign competition by using import duties or quotas. Options available to protect the economy are tariffs, embargoes, subsidies and quotas. 
Let's examine these in turn with some examples. Tariffs are one form of protectionism. It is a tax which is applied to imported goods but not to home produced goods. The idea is to make the imported goods more expensive than the home produced ones so that consumers buy home produced items. An ongoing example of protectionism via tariff is between Britain and the USA. Britain buys most of its bananas from Commonwealth countries, largely in the Caribbean. However, the USA owns banana plantations in South America. In 1999, Britain refused to buy bananas from South America, so the US government put tariffs on some British produced goods. The most famous example was a tariff of 100% import tax on wool products from Scotland brought into the United States. The next method of protectionism is embargoes. An embargo is a complete ban on the import of certain goods. For example, following the Cuban Revolution in the 1950s, the USA banned the import of Cuban cigars. Unfortunately, Cuban cigars are the finest in the world, and there is consequently a thriving black market in Cuban cigars in the USA. As we can see in the example, embargoes can lead to a black market, or unofficial economy, if people want the goods badly enough. Subsidies are a way governments support industries at home with money or tax breaks in order to allow them to compete better with foreign companies. In 1994, the French government provided its national airline with a £2 billion subsidy in order to help it compete with low-cost airlines. However, subsidies can have the effect of making home producers uncompetitive and inefficient. Finally, let's look at quotas. A quota system allows a certain quantity of goods to be imported from other countries. The European Union has had quotas on textiles and clothing for decades to protect its textile industries from developing countries, especially India and China. Understandably, developing countries say that this is unfair and against the principles of free trade. Let's move on now to the arguments for and against protectionism. For trade to flourish between countries, the benefits from trade need to be equally balanced. Where a country feels that it's not getting a fair share of the trade, or that it is somehow disadvantaged, it might employ one or more of the methods of protection. There are at least four arguments that may be given for using protectionism. Firstly, to protect employment in the home country. The simple view is that if imports are stopped, then jobs will be saved and even created at home. Secondly, to prevent unfair competition. It is often said that developing countries have the advantage of cheap labour costs in their countries and that they use this to undercut the price of the same goods produced in richer nations. A tariff might be applied to even out this imbalance. Thirdly, to protect new industries. A new industry, particularly one in a developing country, might not be able to compete with long-established industries elsewhere. Tariffs and quotas give new industries the chance to build up production to the point where they can compete. Fourthly, to raise money. Tariffs were once used as a way of raising revenue for the government. In modern countries, they are now seldom used for this purpose, as the damage to trade often outweighs any immediate benefits. Now for the arguments against protectionism, which are perhaps simpler to summarise. Although trade restrictions might help a country for a short period of time, their overall effect is a negative one. Restrictions affect the flow of trade, and the more countries employ restrictions, the less trade can flow. In the long run, no one benefits from trade restriction, because if one country puts restrictions on another country, the other country then puts their own restrictions on the first country. This affects the first country's exports, and as the country finds it difficult to export goods, then unemployment is the result. So, protection tends to help only the protected and can hide inefficient manufacturers.
That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.